You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back, Health Innovators. On today's episode, I'm sitting down with John Keane, who is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Mind Rhythm. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Dr. Roxy. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, good to have you. So let's start off by telling our audience a little bit about your background and what you've been innovating these days. Sure. Uh, I I like to think of myself uh, primarily as a commercial strategy person. Uh, I started out in pharmaceuticals like many of us in medtech did uh, a long time ago. And uh, I found that I gravitated towards the newer products, new product launches, injectables, and, you know, once dailies and those types of things. And then I went from there into medtech. And over the past 30 years or so, I've been involved in about 35 product launches at every at every level. So at the sales rep level, the junior level management, middle management, senior management. So I've sort of been exposed to what's needed, what works and what doesn't work kind of at every, at every end with the still believe that the most important part is the people in the field. Mm, Okay. (laughs) So So tell me more about that. (laughs) so, that? uh, So I, just with any company, whether it's a medical company or a manufacturing company or consumer electronics, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. If somebody's not interacting with the customer and hearing what they want, what their needs are, what their work environment is like, it's really difficult to know what they need and to know what's right for them. And yeah. the moment that you get out of the field, and which is typically what happens when people go into management, I remember someone saying to me very early on, one of my managers said, the minute you leave the field, you're no longer current. Hmm. And he, I learned from him, he was very good about listening to what his salespeople told him, what his clinical people told him. Sure. And, and so he made better decisions. And that was something that I adopted over the course of my career. That's great. Um, and that is, um, it, it's so true that the closer we stay to the com- uh, to the c- customer, I think that, you know, the more success we'll have, the more we'll be able to pivot and adapt and continue mm-hmm. to deliver value on an ongoing basis when we stay close to the customer, not just this one time of launching something into the market. That's so true. And, and there are things that you, you don't think of that you wouldn't necessarily think about it unless you're talking to customers. Just a simple example, you know, we're working with my current company, we're doing stroke triage and they don't, the EMS professionals don't have any technology available to them. They're only doing stroke assessments mm-hmm. for patients. And I had someone say to me that at the end of a long shift, they're tired and they don't perform the assessment with the same rigor at the end of the shift that they do at the beginning of the shift, which is something I wouldn't have thought of. Yeah, um, And it's just, it came up in conversation yesterday. So it just made me think something I learned from talking to a customer <laughs> 24 hours ago. Yeah. And, you know, being able to, we, we talk, um, we talk about it as uh, different topics, but really all in the same thing of like creating learning organizations where there's this cu- continuous learning, this continuous feedback loop that's in place mm-hmm. to be able to pick up on those little nuances that could make a big difference. You're absolutely right. And I think, the continuous nature of it is a very good point that you make and that if, if someone were to visit an account, they, they get a snapshot of what's going on that particular day at that particular moment in time. And the world is very dynamic, particularly in healthcare. These things change on a regular basis and it requires just constant interaction. And, you know, from uh, people have asked me over the years, you know, how have you come up with your sales strategies, your, your marketing strategies? I'm like, well, it's not that hard. You talk to your customers. <laughs> They'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you what they like, tell you what they don't like. And having worked with, you know, surgeons for years and years, they're not shy about offering their opinions. So it's a pretty easy place to start. Well, I think it's brilliant. It's brilliant to go, you know what? I really come to the conclusion that I don't have to have the answers. <laughs> Makes it easier, doesn't it? <laughs> like, why are all oh, so many people fighting to have the answers when they could just let that go and ask the customer? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's funny because we're, we're joking about this, but on a serious note, I've noticed that over the years sitting in, in management meetings. Mm-hmm. To me, one of the biggest barriers to coming up with a good product design or a good study design or, or whatever is somebody wanting their own voice heard. And 
look, we all have opinions, we all have ideas, and we want to share them, and we want to be treated with respect, and we want people to listen, sure. But it really should start with what is the right thing to do, what does the customer want, what is the proper study, group interactions, in, input from the team. And too often, when I see decisions made that aren't right, it's made by somebody who wanted a decision that was theirs, that didn't have enough specific knowledge to have been able to make the right decisions, just because they don't have the information. So that's something I try to avoid. You know, we call that, um, I, I say we, I didn't make this up, but they, um, the term is hippo, the highest paid, a per, uh, highest paid person's opinion. And what is it? I mean, don't. I've never those, heard that, but boy, is that true. <laughs> there's so many teams, so many companies that, companies that have a hippo in the room. And, I'm, and I always say like, and if you don't know who the hippo is, look in the mirror because it might be you. <laughs> yes, that's so true. And, you know, as, especially as, you know, as consultants, as advisors, as CEOs and co-founders, you know, lo- very often people won't contest our point of view um, and, and, just kind of acquiesce to whatever it is our vision and our strategies and tactics are. And so, you know, that's never going to be a successful path. <laughs> that's a good point. I, I try to, and it's hard sometimes because when people report to you, they feel that chain of command and that they're, yeah. it's not okay. And, and I'll, I'll tell people, it's okay to tell me you disagree with me. Just, I mean, you could be nice about it. You don't have to tell me I'm done. Right, right. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, if you have another, if you have another idea, if you've got an idea that's better than what's there, you're mm-hmm. improving the situation. You're making the company better. You're making the product better. You're helping patients. So that should be expressed. And I do think that in, in many companies, there's a culture where people feel afraid to share their opinions because it's their livelihood. They don't want to lose their job. And so, yeah. um, but that's, it's counterproductive. Yeah. I really like what you're saying is that, you know, we can have this expertise internally, but, you know, we're going to maybe be more successful when we are seeking um, input from outside of the company, outside of the four walls Mm -hmm. on a a regular basis. Yeah. It's, it's such an important thing to do. And I've worked with companies where they don't seek input. They design a medical product without seeking input from medical people, which just seems to me is fundamentally not smart. <laughs> and uh, so I, I can recall um, a conversation, a requirements discussion for those in the call that don't know what this is when you're designing a device that has yeah. requirements that have to be in it. And one of the things that we had for this particular monitor that's going to be used in an operating room was that the cord would have to withstand 500 pounds of weight being rolled over it. And the team was like, well, how often is 500 pounds of weight going to get rolled over this cord? And I'm like, in an operating room in a hospital? I don't know, at least once a day. <laughs> and they couldn't believe it, you know. But, you know, you have to be, again, you have to be in the environment to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That type of shadowing, too, is even different than, um, you know, just asking people what they think about something. Uh, we have some conversations here on the show about the difference between, you know, um, seeking input from customers and really gathering these new insights about, well, what are they trying to accomplish versus mm-hmm asking them, well, what do you want? Because they can't, like, you know, we often use the Steve Jobs example. If you to ask customers, what do they want? Not very many people would have said, well, you know what I want? I want an iPod. I want a thousand songs in my pocket. We weren't right. thinking that revolutionary, um, but there's still ways to be able to facilitate that conversation with the customers to be able to figure out what they're trying to accomplish, what job are they trying to do, and still be able to come up with revolutionary ways to be able to address that. That's, that's very well said. Um, and I, I don't think I've thought about it in that fashion before. We had a call today um, mm. uh, internally where we're making a product design decision. Yeah. And essentially one of the components of it was, should this be disposable or reusable? Mm. And my experience with disposables and reusables is most customers say they want reusables, but they don't like them when they get them. And uh, so you have it available and then nobody ends up using them and they throw them out. And they get upset that they're spending more money. And um, so you, phrasing the conversation, how you put it, you know, what are you trying to accomplish versus what do you want? Well, right. if you say, what do you want? They're going to say, we want a u- reusable. Well, do you really in an ambulance at two o'clock in the morning in Newark when it's raining? <laughs> you know, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, right. And that's, that's probably a better way to have that conversation where you can guide them down the pathway of what you're trying to do, mm-hmm. getting that input, but making sure that that input is is qualified in some manner. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, you know, it's I, usually to your point is that there's a big difference when we're asking someone, would you, would you buy, would you like this? You know, is this something that you would use? And then, okay, like how much would you pay for it? No, oh, sure. no, 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 no. I won't pay for it. Right. right. I would right. use it, but I don't want to buy it. I'm not going to give you my money for it. <laughs> yeah, interesting thing with respect to money um, found in fundraising. Mm. Uh, all of our investors thought that we didn't have our product priced high enough. Mm. All of our customers thought we had our price, product priced too high. Okay. <laughs> so I noticed that the people who think that the pricing on things is too low are the people who stand to make money off of a higher price. The people who think it's too high are the ones who have to pay for it. So <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how that goes. And, and that to me is a great use case for this type of qualitative market research that we are doing with customers to be able to create a business case. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're talking with investors and you're saying, well, we disagree or, you know, um, this is the price where we think it should be. And you're kind of coming up with a different scenario to kind of back up that decision. That's very different than actually if you've got like interviews, videos of customers saying what they will pay. Mm-hmm. Right. That's going to be so much more powerful feedback that people can't contest. <laughs> it, it's a lot more difficult to rebut both for ourselves as whether those advisors or investors are having that conversation. Like when you're hearing directly from the customers now. It's really easy to adjust pricing in the boardroom. You just change it on a spreadsheet. You see your margins go up. You see your revenues go up. You're like, but this is it, the direction we should be going. <laughs> yeah, but if, if they don't buy it, your revenues are zero. And right. um, so it, uh, yeah. yeah. Totally. So yeah, I had this, um, you know, experience personally where I was pricing something really high and not selling it very often, and then changed it to where I actually went much lower than what I had wanted, and was kind of so instead of going high and going no sales, no sales, no sales, need to drop it, no sales, (laughs) going low and going sales, but they said yes too quick. Okay, now I'm going to increase it a little bit. Okay, Mm -hmm. I'm still getting sales, but they still said yes too quick. And then all of a sudden you get to that point where you're like, no, now they're taking a little bit longer time. And you kind of figure out where your sweet spot is on pricing, but you're still building sales along the way, as opposed to going so high. It's like, okay, no sales for months because I'm too high. (laughs) Well, that's, you know, that's market research without a net. Right, 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 exactly. (laughs) But that's also, you know, that willingness to adapt is um, a really, really important skill. Mm-hmm. in really in life, but in business in particular, your willingness to say, okay, I'm not selling anything and the price is probably too high. And then yeah. well, let's just do a radical reset. Oh, maybe the price is too low. And then you eventually found where you needed to be yep. through, the, through the willingness to change. And <laughs> um, your, your point about the, uh, the hippo, another characteristic there is, you know, our ignorance brings us to a mistake and our arrogance keeps us in that mistake. Ooh, that's good. It's not my <laughs> original line. It's been applied to me quite a bit, but it's, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so, good for our viewers and listeners to chime into. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is the type of thing where I think because how we're brought up in our education system, it's we reward being correct and mm. we, we punish being incorrect. Mm. But when you're doing something new, you're not incorrect, yeah. you're learning. And um, so if you do something and it's not working out right and you adapt and you have a little bit of success, that's, a, that's an evolutionary pathway. And to me, I view that as a very positive um, development. So I, I don't ever feel like, oh, geez, we did something and it was wrong and now we got to fix it. I feel like, okay, we learned what not to do. Now we'll try something new. And, and I think being transparent about that can be so powerful because it it really demonstrates that there is no ego and that you are really open to learning and that you are adaptive. And so often I see innovators, especially startups, you know, wanting to present themselves to investors or potential customers as they've got it all figured out. You know, they kind of mapped point A to point B with three steps in between, and they've just been plugging their way and mm-hmm. without being really candid about what's going on. And 
and and and really thinking that that's actually going to lead to more success, but it's not true. It's not reality. And so, if we were more vulnerable and more transparent about those learning opportunities, I think we'd have more trust and more credibility, and end up being more on a path of success instead of trying to fake like everything's just been perfect. <laughs> I completely agree with that. Uh, in the beginning, it can be very difficult because the answer to virtually everything is, I don't know. <laughs> right, right. <yeah. laughs> and so, because, it's, you know, it's you start out with an idea on a cocktail napkin and it's, you, you need to, to prove a number of things. But I, I yeah. do think, you know, this is, uh, this was my first foray into fundraising. Mm-hmm. And, you know, product launches, design, what needs to happen, the FDA and all of the strategy and all of that. I've done that for a long time. But yep. fundraising was very new. And, um, you like it? You want to just keep doing it? Well, now that it's done, I like it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I, Asked I, me a couple months ago, and maybe not so much, but today's a good day. <laughs> I started out um, not liking it, and I ended up liking it quite a bit. And I, not liking it for the obvious reasons, right? I moved oh, into wow. I moved into the uncomfortable. I moved into an area where I didn't have expertise, and I said things, and you know, got schooled quite a bit because I didn't know certain terminology. I had to learn that. So that's, that's uncomfortable. Um, I also didn't like it because I love strategy. I love, you know, coming up with the commercial strategy and the design. It's what I've done for so long. It's fun. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I was told in no uncertain terms by my colleagues, you know, you, your job is to keep the gas in the gas tank. And you, you really are going to spend a lot of your time raising money. And of course, during COVID, it was more challenging. Sure. And at first I was like, oh, it's taking me away from something I really like doing. And I had to get used to trusting the people around me Mm -hmm. to take on some of those things. And so there was like an inflection point where I sort of developed a certain level of knowledge and skills with the fundraising and got used to handing off some of these things to other really qualified people that I've worked with over the years. And I've seen them grow in their careers. And I was like, Oh, I've got good people that can do this. It doesn't have to be me. Good. I can sleep tonight. (laughs) So it's, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's ended up working out uh, quite a bit. And now that the raise is over, I get to go back to some of that stuff. But sure. yeah. it's, it's really the primary role. And just, you know, um, how do we get comfortable with it is just do it, right? <laughs> and do it's it, like and do it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I mean, the first time you run a 50-yard dash or throw a football <laughs> or pick up the guitar, you're not going to be good at it. So or play just, the drums. <laughs> oh, you see the drums behind me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but I can't remember picking up a drumstick because I was so young the first time I did that uh-huh. uh, all drummers are like this. You ask any drummer, we, why did you start playing the drums? Like, I don't know. I just always wanted to play the drums. <laughs> and every drummer has a picture of themselves with, with wooden spoons hitting the pots and pans in okay. mom and dad's kitchen. So, Innate, huh? <laughs> well, it's just more than just doing it for a long, long time. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But drums, <laughs> so, you never get good. <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about Mind Rhythm and what you're innovating there and kind of where you are in this innovation or commercial process. So Mind Rhythm is a company right now we're focused specifically on stroke triage. And um, I'll I'll cover a little bit about that because there isn't, even in the medical world, even in neuro, there's not really a lot of knowledge with respect to what goes on pre-hospital. So there, you can basically have three types of strokes. You can have a hemorrhagic stroke, which is bleed. There's nothing they, right now, there's nothing they can really do for that other than lower your blood pressure and evacuate in certain situations. Um, If you're having an ischemic stroke, that's that's a clot. And it's, mm-hmm. if you have a heart attack, you're having a clot in the heart, that clot goes to your brain. If you goes to a small blood vessel, you have a small vessel occlusion stroke. If you have a large vessel occlusion stroke, it's a big clot in a big vessel. For small vessels, they treat them with a drug. With large vessels, there's only 300 places in the country that can treat that. And you mm-hmm. have to go to one of those hospitals in order to have them go in and take the clot out of your head. Yep. And it's such, a, it's such an important technology that it's the difference between getting treated and walking out of the hospital two days later or being potentially in a nursing home for 30 years, permanently disabled, like not moving half your body. So it's a, it's really a binary situation. Sure. And so right now in the U S there's no way to tell what type of stroke somebody's having. So they're going to the hospital, they scan them, they determine the stroke and then they transfer them. So it takes hours to get treatment and it causes permanent disability. So Mm -hmm. we've developed a device that can identify that for the paramedics in 90 seconds in an ambulance. So they can say large vessel occlusion stroke, 
they need to go to, I'm in Boston, so they need to go to Mass General, Brigham and Women's, Beth Israel, one of those hospitals. Um, in San Francisco, you'd go to UCSF. And the more rural you get in your communities, the longer the transport time is. And in, in outside the U.S., it's significantly worse. It, it could be four or five hours in Ireland to a hospital that can treat you. By then, you know, you're dead. Yeah. So that's, that's what we're aiming to solve. We are, um, the device works. We have two published papers, mm -hmm. uh, but we're, most companies would take those papers and get FDA clearance now. Yep. We chose not to do that. Uh, and this is based, uh, my own experience, I find that nobody will use medical technology, new medical technology, unless you prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it works. And then you have to prove it's better than what they have. In our case, they don't have anything else. Uh, also, um, so we, what happens wait, wait, is, wait, I want to pause there for a second. In your case, what? They don't have an option. So we're filling something that doesn't exist right now. Yeah. So if it's, mm -hmm. if it's a brain tumor and you have a new way of removing brain tumors, well, they have open resection, they have radiation therapy, they have laser treatments, chemo, all different things you can use with us. Nothing exists. So that part of the pathway is actually easier for us sure. because the paramedics want what we have, mm -hmm. but in general, there's resistance to using new things. It, it's very difficult, as you know, to get new medical technology um, adopted. Sure. So in a, in a startup situation, without this proof, we're doing an ambulance-based trial right now to show that it works in the environment where it will be used. We're doing it in Metro Detroit through Wayne State. And um, short of that, I don't believe we will have the um, support to change state policies because most of these practices of where to take patients are determined by state protocol. Mm -hmm. They're not going to change state protocols without evidence-based medicine. Yep. So that's what we're doing. A, a typical scenario, and I've worked for companies that have done this, they try to get the product approved for as little money as possible, which means no FDA trial or limited trial, get it out. And then they hire a sales force, which is very expensive. And then they go across the country. They don't sell anything. And then beat you know, them over the six, head and say, why aren't you selling? <laughs> so I, I think the reason I'm so sensitive to that is I was in that role so often. I was the VP of sales, which is, you know, it's the bullseye position. You get blamed yep. for everybody else's mistakes. <laughs> and so uh, I just, I was like, we're not going to do that. And yeah. it's helpful because I work with people who are very experienced. So they've seen the same thing. And then one of my mm -hmm. colleagues is a neurologist. So He's focused on stroke as a physician. He doesn't want to put something onto the market that isn't fully vetted in the environment just because mm -hmm. it's his reputation. Yeah, so sure. we're, we're all in alignment on that. And um, so we are pre-FDA. We just submitted our FDA pre-sub about an hour ago. And, <laughs> and, I don't suppress people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like we, we, we oh. spent a lot of time on it because they're, we didn't even understand the pre-hospital situation and mm -hmm. defining the problem is very important because if we don't define the problem correctly, the solution isn't going to be viewed as valuable as it actually is. I mean, this is a, literally a life-saving uh, and life-altering product. And so we, if we don't define that, you know, that's on us. Hey, it's Dr. Roxy here with a quick break from the conversation. Are you trying to figure out what moves you need to make to survive and thrive in the new COVID economy? I want every health innovator to find their most viable and profitable pivot strategy, which is why I created the COVID Proof Your Business Pivot Kit. The Pivot Kit is a step-by-step -step framework that helps you find your best pivot strategy. It walks you through six categories you need to examine for a 360 degree view of your business. I call them the six critical pivot lenses. As you make your way through this comprehensive kit, you'll be armed with the tools, tips, and strategies you need to make sure you can pivot with speed without missing out on critical details and opportunities. Learn more at legacy-dna.com backslash kit. So one of the things that I see often, and I'm not saying that this is the case with you, I just kind of want to explore this, is that I'll see innovators come up with solutions to problems that their target audience doesn't know exists or is not looking to solve. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that's a dead-end business or a dead-end innovation. It just means that there is a very different strategy um, to commercialize something like that when you're in a very mature problem market 
um, or the, how do we say that? The, the problem is very mature, right? The market is very familiar with the problem. They just trying to choose between A and the new thing mm-hmm. or versus when there's, it's a very immature problem market. Like we don't even, there's a population that doesn't even know they have this problem. So as you think through that, um, you know, kind of tell us um, what you've encountered or how, what's the strategy for being able to educate the market about this particular problem and, and kind of elevating it as a priority for them to seek to solve it. So what you just asked a question that um, I'm going to answer this in a different way um, than you phrased the question, because you're the first person who's ever brought this topic up. And it's such an important topic to me. Mm-hmm. I tell everybody the single biggest thing that you can have with the new medical technology is to have a technology that has a known problem that they don't have a solution for that they actually want. Yep. And you almost never have those things. Right. You, you either have something that they have, a, they have another solution for. And now you're, what was the old thing? Who moved my cheese? You know, you're changing, you know, you're changing what or they have C. to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they, don't, yeah. <laughs> they don't, they don't want it. They have something new. They have to learn something. They don't think it's a problem. You know, I work with transfusions, which is a huge problem. Nobody thought it was a problem. Yep. And I've actually tried to convey this to our investors because we actually have this situation. We have a product that's a huge problem. Uh, this situation is a huge problem. It's really well known and everybody wants it. And so I probably should be careful since you're recording this because my investors will read this or they'll, they'll watch this. And they'll be like, oh, John, you're not selling much. You said that everybody wanted this. <laughs> uh, but in, I've never experienced this with anything I've worked with before. I've had people try to buy this from us in prototype form. And, and I'm like, Can I we don't get a look quarter good. of it. Can we just, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm not, I'm not saying this to, to like push this, you know, on the podcast. I'm saying this is literally, I was shocked when I encountered this. Mm-hmm. I was expecting, you know, I have this joke, a, a, a friend of mine sent me a picture of the world's first anesthesia machine, which is in the medical museum in Paris. And it was my clinical person. She sent me a picture. Mm -hmm. And she said, look, the world's first anesthesia machine. And I said, and 10 minutes later, the world's first anesthesiologist said, what do I need a machine for? (laughs) That's the resistance (laughs) to new technology. So I was, my expectation is always to have that resistance. In our case, we don't have that. We have the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. We've got a problem that we, we benefit everybody because the places that are doing these surgeries, you know, the hospital makes a lot of money. The patients benefit the patients that can't the hospitals that can't treat, they don't want those patients coming to their hospital. Right. And the ambulance crews don't like dropping off people at the wrong hospital where they know that they're not going to get good care. So everybody benefits Mm -hmm. where I think we're going to have our challenges is actually a unique situation for us, which is at the state level, Mm -hmm. because these are all policy driven practices. State of Massachusetts, where I live, um, they, they designated that all strokes go to the closest stroke center. There are two types of stroke centers, primary stroke centers, comprehensive stroke centers. Only the comprehensives can treat these big, big strokes. So most patients end up going to a primary stroke center. They get scanned. If they have a small stroke, they get treated there. If they're having a large stroke, they get transferred. In Mm. Massachusetts, they, the community hospitals got upset when they designated primary stroke centers as the places that all stroke patients would go to. So the response by the state was to designate every hospital as a primary stroke center. So <laughs> that's not a good response. And so the, we're working, we're doing a pilot project with one of the EMS companies to change state practice. That's where I think we're going to run into our challenge. And that is unique. I've never worked with anything yeah. like this before. What about being um, the term that you use is pre-hospital? So yes. that's something that I don't uh, come across very often as well. Um, is 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 that considered kind of a prevention solution? Um, you know, and are there any things that we need to be aw- that you need to be aware of, or we need to be aware of when we're thinking about pre-hospital solutions? So it's a good question. I've spent my entire career working in the hospital, mm-hmm. and pre-hospital is the term that they use the hospital people use as the care that takes place before the patient gets to the hospital. You'll hear um, like in cardiac arrest, that's yep. a neurological injury, but the, the, the life-saving behavior takes place before they get to the hospital. So they'll always say we need to affect pre-hospital care. So that's a commonly 
okay. used term in the EMS world. Okay. So to your point, there there isn't a lot that goes on pre-hospital because there isn't a lot of technology. The, the paramedics and EMTs, they live in a special world by mm-hmm. themselves, right? So yeah. they, they have defibrillators, mm-hmm. they've got EKG, <laughs> they have end tidal CO2, and they have pulse oximetry. That mm-hmm. is their entire technological armamentarium. Yeah. Everything yeah. else is a 911 call, unknown situation, assess this in a chaotic environment is not an easy mm-hmm. job. Yeah. So you can see why they, they embrace the technology like ours, because they're like, oh, thank God we have something, you know. <laughs> right. And um, so they, there isn't a lot of technology. Since there's not a lot of technology, there aren't a lot of companies making things and there aren't a lot of and therefore, the, the, you know, there's not a lot of FDA regulatory stuff. There's not reimbursement associated with it. It's it's all its own world. And then the EMS world is also very different because you have public companies, private companies, hospital owned companies. And then fire departments, mm-hmm. and they all they're all and then med flight, and they're all taking care of the same patient group, but in a different way. So it's it's I've never worked with it before, but I was fortunate enough. I worked for Zoll for a while. Okay. And Zoll was Zoll's a major manufacturer of defibrillators, so a big um, portion of their sales force spends time strictly in EMS. In fact, some of the people on the Zoll team have helped me with, um, I mean, helped our company but with specific mm-hmm. introductions and with gaining an understanding of what's really essentially a very different environment than the hospital mm-hmm. environment. Sure. Yeah. I can see that. And we might actually be a hybrid because we might actually be purchased by the hospital and then given to the ambulance companies. There's a business model for that. Mm-hmm. Um, there are specific Medicare rules pertaining to it. You know, you can't, it's not a kickback. You can't give it to them in exchange for patients. Um, but that's true. <laughs> yeah. So you, know, you got to be careful of doing something sure. like that in there. So there are guidelines associated with it, but it makes sense. The yeah. hospital's making the money off the patient. The ambulance company is it's costing them money to buy this technology to route them to the correct hospital. They're willing to do it, but the real financial beneficiary is the hospital and the insurance company. Yeah. Just another example of the complexities of um, commercializing and innovation in healthcare with all of these multi-sided markets and the tangled web we weave. <laughs> One of the guys who's on our board is a longtime friend of mine, actually through music, uh, Kyle York. And he he um, he specializes in tech. He sold his company to Oracle a few years back okay. and he's running a tech fund. And he's always like, your world is so difficult. Your product actually has to work before you get it onto the market. <laughs> <laughs> and not just work, but work better than anything else that's already exactly. on the market. <laughs> exactly. He's like, he's like, you know, with, with software, you can just make something, put it up and then work on it while it's out there. And it's just Correct. healthcare's healthcare's challenging, but it's, yeah. it's rewarding. It's worth it. It's a nice place to be. So, so you've got a pretty interesting lineup of investors, uh, I'm sorry, not investors, advisors that are part of your advisory team or advisory council. Um, some pretty big hitters. Mm-hmm. So just kind of share with our audience, um, you know, how that came about. I mean, most people are trying to figure out how do they get the best advisors that put them in the right position, whether it's going to be introductions, funding, strategic guidance, whatever that's going to you know, be. Um, but how did you um, get access to these folks? And, you know, is that making a difference for you and your company? So I would say... Um... The unique situation that I had mm-hmm. is probably was really instrumental for me being able to complete the race mm-hmm. as, as a first time doing this with not a lot of contacts. Yes. So some of this won't really be transferable because it's kind of luck. My colleague, Wade, Dr. Smith, is a, he's a very well-known neurologist at a very, it's the UCSF is the top ranked the top neurology department in the United States. And he's a director at the department. He was instrumental in the original um, thrombectomy trials, the ones that the technology for treating these large strokes. So mm-hmm. He's very well known and he's in San Francisco. So ah. he, he, so he's helped a lot of people. He's taken care of family members who are grateful and there's, mm-hmm. he does a lot of research. So he has a number of contacts. My other colleague, Paul is he's been an entrepreneur for a number of years. So he has his level of contacts of people that we could um, talk to. And then I had my own, you know, m- much fewer contacts, but I had my own sure. group of people that I, that were in my network. 
And so what I found is, I mean, that's a really, that's a really good head start to have if you, if you're, if you've never done fundraising and it's like, Oh, John, you know, let me introduce you to the inventor of robotic surgery. And, um, sure. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk to him and you know, let me, let me introduce you to the inventor of YouTube. It's a lot easier to talk to those people when you get personal introductions to them. So a, a lot of it was that. And mm -hmm. so that's just lucky. I guess kind of lucky because I had known Dr. Smith from my previous companies and we have a good relationship. So, you know, the career does, you know, feed into it, but that access is, I wouldn't have had on my own. The, so I want to um, just pause for there for a second, because you said kind of lucky, but, you know, kind of, I had this prior relationship that led to these other things. I, I, th I think what's important, like a good takeaway for our audience here is, is that, you know, those relationships that we're cultivating early in our career are usually like lifetime customers or life there's a lifetime of value associated with that relationship so it's not going to be just that one company that we worked with them and then kind of we moved on and i mean there'll be those people but there will be the other people where you deliver incredible value and you really cultivate a strong relationship and those people will be either your customers in the future for your next five or ten businesses or they'll be part of your network that conduit that's leading you to future customers and so um i think you know that's one of the threads that i think that i pick up on that maybe most innovators don't even articulate is, is that as you're moving through your career, um, you know, those formidable relationships just continue to pay off because you're delivering value. You drew in the right thing, even maybe when it's not always the best financial thing, but you're doing the right thing and delivering value and they just become incredible um, for our careers. Uh, it's very well said. I I think I hesitated there when I said it was, it was lucky. And I, my hesitation was exactly what you're referring to because yeah, right. I, I would, you know, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that it was, an, I am grateful to be in this environment where I was able to be introduced to those people. But at the same time, I think for, for all of us, where we're at in life, a lot of times can be attributed to what we've done previously and so it's not just the things that worked out that contribute the things that don't work out. Right. You also learn too. Yeah, and so, exactly. you know, and so I went from various VPs of sales roles. So I have a, there's a whole network of people that I know when I need a sales team, I'll have a good group of people. Yeah. I have the strategy and everything else, but I also had roles where I was speaking to investors before I was doing this. So each one of these things prepares us for our next role. Yeah. And I, and I think to your point, if, if you engage with people in a genuine and authentic way, mm -hmm. treat people with respect, you do cultivate relationships over the years. Mm -hmm. And eventually um, the combination of different skills and hard work and things that worked and things that didn't work can lead to something. These last few years of my life have been, um, they've taken a lot of uh, commitment on my part because when you start a company, you're not taking a salary. Of, yes. of any type. And, um, you know, we had no money and my previous company went out of business and there was a lot of turmoil and I, I involved in the drum company as well. And so I had a lot of um, cash outflows and a lot of risks that I was taking on. Yeah. And, you know, nobody sees that part of it, right? They, they and see nobody the talks about it either. No. <laughs> but act like that doesn't exist. It was just like I strategically made this decision and everything was great. I had this big payout on my last gig that's, you know, funded me for now. But, you know, I mean, just fake it until you become it and without being real about what, what this life is really like. <laughs> I, absolutely. And mm -hmm. I said to um, um, my cousin, who's a good friend, and he's an investor in the company. He's a, actually a lawyer for a med tech firm. Mm -hmm. um, when we're not talking about music and cars, we talk about um, we talk about med tech. And he said, you know, I don't, it takes a lot of courage to doing to do what you're doing, and you know, not taking a salary, starting a company from scratch, not knowing where it's going to go. And I said, you know, I, I've reached the point. I've always wanted to do this, and I've wanted to have a team in place of people with a similar philosophy and a similar life view that I have. I, we'll yeah. either all get along really well or we'll be at each other's throats, but we'll find out. Yeah. And, uh, but I've always wanted to do it. If I don't take this chance at this point in my life, you know, with what I'm able to do, yeah. then I just, I don't, I think I'm not living courageously. Mm -hmm. And um, 
So I, I'm saying that because for the last few years, I've on a personal level, I've been like, is it really so smart to live so courageously? <laughs> and, <laughs> right, right. And uh, <laughs> things are starting to come together now, right? The company's yeah. starting to have some success and we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. And um, like, I, I wake up in the morning and I, I have to be awake for a few minutes to be like, oh, no, no, there's no major crisis I'm dealing with today. Things are, things are going well, it's smooth. And which is not to say there won't be you know, this afternoon coming out or, <laughs> right, exactly, right, or, right. Tomorrow, or tomorrow or, or something else. But um, it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm describing my role in particular, yeah. but the people in my team, it's the same thing. They're taking a chance. They could be at, you know, I, I have people who are, are working that could be at these, they've come from large med tech companies with big salaries and, yeah. and, and 401ks and security and everything else. And they're taking a chance on this. Mm -hmm. And that's our team. Or it's a team of people who believe in what they're doing, who want to contribute, make a difference on this planet and do well. And, you know, sure, we want to grow the company and, and make lots of money or sell the company and profit from that. I'm sure, we all want to do that. But I think the primary motivation for everybody is getting up in the morning and doing something that they think is worthwhile. And working Perfect. in an environment where we all we admire each other and we yeah. <laughs> work together as a team and we have fun. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, you, it, everybody's taking a risk, uh, right? And in, in looking out for the reward on the back end of that. So as we kind of just start to wrap up here, John, I want to give you just another opportunity to say, okay, if you kind of like think back to um, your experience with Mind Rhythm and, and maybe this most recent, you know, um, seed endeavor, or, or maybe it's even going further back in some other commercialization experiences and product launches that you've had, are there any other lessons learned that we haven't touched on that you just want to make sure that you share with our audience um, who's also in the trend? Um, doing different things at different stages, um, but any other wisdom yet you want to share with them? So I think the, the lesson that I, the story I tell all the time is I learned, I didn't know it. I learned virtually most of everything I learned about business. I learned growing up because my dad owned his own business. Mm -hmm. So my whole life was kind of an involuntary MBA course. He, he would ask me questions. I'm like, you know, I can, re I can recall one time sitting at Massachusetts general parking lot in my hockey equipment, you know, uh -huh. he stopped there on the way to a game and he's got this customer situation. He's running it by me. And he's like, now, how would you handle this? I'm like, wait, I'm how old were you? I was 10. I'm like, I'm 10 years old. I have no idea. How to handle this. And so he would grill these things into me. And oh. so, um, I mean, it's, it's just, I, it's just a vivid memory, but my whole life was like that. And the thing he always said to me, which I think is we've covered part of this, but the, the first part of it was, he said, reserve your judgment. He mm. said, get all of the information you can possibly get before you make a decision, get, get input from everybody that you work with, all of the different stakeholders, your customers, um, competitors, wherever you can get it, get information and, and be neutral about it. Don't, bring your own ego and emotion into your decision-making and question everything. Then when you make a decision, make it. And if it doesn't work, adapt. Yeah. And I think if you apply that philosophy pretty much to anything, it's going to work. By the way, he, did, he wasn't so open to when I said question him. Right, right, right. Let's be clear. <laughs> but, but right? question business things. You know, he, was, you know, no, he's, he was great with that. What uh, did he do in his career? He actually, he owned a medical company, but it wasn't med tech like we think of it. Uh -huh. He owned a um, medical record company. Oh. Okay. And so his, his uh, business model was different because he was dealing with the people in medical records in the hospital mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. information chain. And uh, he actually, one of the things that he did that I thought should have taken off that never did yep. was uh, he tried to partner with all the electronic medical record companies when we were moving over to the electronic medical record, he said, physicians don't like looking at computer screens. They like holding these charts. And if you design this without using the way these charts are, yeah, you're going to design it and nobody would bite on it. And look what we have now. We have mm -hmm. things where you got to click back for things to find something. And then they weren't designed with the end user. Yeah. Um, so we're all electronic at this point, but, um, 
I know. I thought it, it was a We're good not idea. happy about it. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not an efficient workflow necessarily. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I was always in hospitals, you know, I was always go with him ah. to hospitals, but it, you know, the medical side of it, he was never into the medicine. He came up through the paper industry. Right. Right. The business part of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. Um, okay. So how do folks get a hold of you? If anybody wants to learn more about mind rhythm or just connect with you after the show? Um, well, there's always the easy ways, right? LinkedIn, you can just connect yeah. with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty open to whoever connect with me. Uh, there's a contact at mind rhythm, which will eventually get to me, or you could just email me at mind rhythm. It's just john.keen at mind And, uh, and reach out. I'm, I tend to be pretty responsive. Um, my background in sales is just, you know, I, I used to say to people, I'm the dumbest person in the room, but I'll return your phone call. And, <laughs> and so uh, I do get pulled in a lot of different directions. So if it takes uh, me a bit to get back sometimes, I just, I apologize. Bear with me. I try, I do try to be responsive. Uh, if, yeah. if I don't, you get, and you ping me a second time, I'm not going to be offended. So uh, <laughs> isn't that the world we live in today? Please don't yes. anyone take it personal. You need to reach out at least three times Exactly. <laughs> just to <Exactly>. be fair. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was such a great conversation. So much wisdom that you shared with our audience today. I know that they will find it very valuable. Oh, thanks. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate you inviting me on it. Had a good time and hopefully people get something out of it. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.